and welcome to this special edition of Trader Talk TV coming from Cannes. And today we've got Sean Buckley. Sean, how are you? Doing well. Great to be here. Sean's the CRO of SpotX and he's here today to talk about some of the um, stuff that's going on in video at the minute, programmatic video specifically. Sean, before we talk about that, give us an overview of your role at SpotX, please. Sure, so I sort of oversee two uh, main groups. One is our platform group, which brings our technology to media owners, so publishers, broadcasters, and the other is our demand facilitation team, which is a services business that helps connect our platform customers with the buyers that matter to them. So you make all the money in SpotX. <laughs> you're the, you're the money man. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> so um, with a few, few subjects today on this uh, Trade Talk TV edition, um, let's talk about header bidding first, because that's obviously sure. been a huge subject in display advertising, but seems you can make it its way into video right now. So let's talk about the dynamics first of all. I mean, mm -hmm. are, is there a huge difference between header bidding for display and header bidding for video? There are substantial differences, and you know, from what I personally read in the trades, right, we've seen uh, two camps, right? We've seen some folks who say, hey, header bidding has no place in video. And then we've seen other folks who say, hey, header bidding is going to completely disrupt video the same exact way it did in display. We fall somewhere in the middle in terms of our mindset. We do feel that there are applications for header bidding in video, but especially for the foreseeable future, perhaps it's not a fit everywhere. Yeah. Um, there are definitely additional complexities, like as you get to long form potted ad delivery, you look at things like frequency management and deduplication in pods and competitive separation in pods, and these are certainly challenges that exist in video and don't exist in display. Yeah. But we think there are certainly applications. A lot of the news you've seen to date, I think, has been centered around the outstream space, but yeah. certainly as you get into short form and pre-roll, there, there are definitely applications there, in our opinion. Why? Why is it necessary to have header bidding in video? If there is such a, su a supply constraint within the ecosystem, why do you need to have a wrapper managing God knows how many he uh, header bidders? I think, there are, I think there are certain similarities to display in that perhaps some of the shortage is created by access um, in terms of programmatic. And so um, traditional direct sales has been sort of the dominant transaction model in digital video, uh, sort of the upfront guaranteed style buys, that can still exist in programmatic, but the plumbing hasn't really aligned, right? So you still have the situation with legacy ad servers and, and waterfalls. And so the ability to bring programmatic demand effectively into the equation, allow that to compete with traditional direct sales, or in some cases even preempt traditional direct sales for the right price, it's more of a technology discussion and um, that can certainly help um, make programmatic a more pervasive part of, of digital video. But to my earlier points, there are definitely challenges as you get to long form. So why not just build an ad server that does all that? Well, I mean, so that for me, header bidding, and I'm sure I'm going to offend a lot of our audience, but I just <laughs> think header bidding is a hack. It still is a hack. Why can't someone just build an ad server to do all the holistic yield optimization? That would be, that would be the most logical thing. Get rid of your, your waterfall, build an ad server where you can do proper yield optimization, sure. manage all your demand, and actually make the most amount of money. Why don't, why don't you do that? Well, that's exactly what we're doing here at uh, SpotX, and certainly that's our long-term vision. Um, you know, the way our platform operates, we completely eliminate the waterfall. All the ad decisioning is done in parallel. We still give our customers the ability to manage things like priority, pacing, capping, yeah. flighting, all yeah. the tools you typically see in a traditional ad server, but certainly with a modern twist in terms of how the architecture is built from the ground up with programmatic in mind. Um, did you always have an ad server or is this new? Uh, I think- Because I always thought like SpotX was effectively the SSP sure. of choice. Sure, I think the company's been through a few different um, sort of evolutions or revolutions. We've started as an exchange or, or a marketplace that sat between buyers and sellers and allowed them to transact programmatically. Uh, back in 2013, we moved more into the SSP space where they could not only manage you know, programmatic demand coming through our platform, but they could bring their own demand into the system, whether that be sort of tags from ad networks, yeah. programmatic direct campaigns uh, transacted via deal ID. And more recently, over the past year and a half, we've been really focused on the traditional ad serving tools that we feel are relevant now and are gonna remain relevant long into the distant future. So the goal here is not to replicate the legacy systems that publishers have been using to date, but to build a modern system that puts our customers in a great spot moving yeah, forward. Yeah, yeah. So in terms of the trends this year, I mean, you know, you've, we've, we're looking at programmatic in TV, like, mm -hmm. and we already had one of your colleagues on doing the Trader Talk sure. talk about Magic TV, but let's talk about the key trends you see this year as TV moves more into programmatic, where do you see that happen? 
I mean, connected TV and OTT is just a it's a it's a massive movement, specifically in the U.S. market. I mean, um, TV. When you, mean, when you connect the TV, are we talk about over the top or what specifically? Specifically over the top delivery. So obviously, we differentiate between the the private infrastructure, which yeah. is how we describe traditional TV, and then the internet delivered television uh, or what we call connected TV. Yeah, yeah. So like um, the Ro Roku boxes, sure, that, that kind of thing. Apple right? TV, Roku boxes. Um, you know, gaming consoles, yeah. all of these things apply. Um, and so, you know, TV is still the dominant medium in the U.S. market, still a very important part of, of media and the consumer experience in the living room. However, as you saw, Q1 of this year uh, had pretty substantial subscriber losses in the, in the pay TV Absolutely. space, almost 800,000 yeah. in the U.S. market in aggregate. Uh, and so cord cutting is real, yeah. uh, cord nevers are real. And I think the market Cord is, nevers, yeah. yeah, folks who never subscribe to pay TV service right. uh, go straight to perhaps the different experience, the app-based experience yeah. in the, in the uh, connected TV yes. world. Um, and so this change is, is definitely... So the big thing that seems to be happening, I, I, I don't know if you've seen that this morning, Netflix are actually part, testing a pre-roll. Mm. So we've always said once that happens, the shoe is going to fall. That's mm. going to kill, it's going to open the floodgates. What do you think that's, do you think that, the, like obviously Netflix being the dominant, um, you know, uh, connected TV uh, uh, piece, now they're starting to look at pre-rolls. Is that, is that the start of you think? I mean, I, I, th I think it's already been sort of a, a snowball effect that's in motion. Um, you know, I think there was always a question, are those guys gonna always stay subscription only? Are they yeah. gonna introduce some form of, of ad model? Uh, one of the things we paid attention to was sort of the economics for the content creators. And while YouTube and Netflix have had a lot of success, if you look at net net, what do the content creators actually make yeah, yeah. outside of their own yeah. sort of original content, uh, we think it's important to pay attention to. And, and certainly the television world provided the best economics to date. And so do you need that sort of dual model with both subscription and ad supported revenue to yeah. make it a long term sustainable business? There's lots of different opinions on that in the market, but obviously more ad supported business is is great for our industry and yeah, great absolutely. for products for sure. Could you see substantial uh, spend shifting towards that, like if something like Netflix and then obviously if Netflix goes, all the rest will follow. Could you see that money shifting fairly quickly from 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 the traditional TV ecosystem, as you say, into connected TV. Yeah, we personally think over the next uh, you know two or three years, we're going to start to see big blocks of money move from traditional TV into connected TV. Um, I think to date, uh, there's probably some money that comes out of there. TV has remained pretty resilient. It's still a $70 billion ad market in the US alone. Yeah. Uh, and I think some of the money flowing into the space has perhaps come from other areas and other medias that are in very visible decline. Yeah. But as we move forward, some of the capabilities Abilities, I think that connected TV provides are going to definitely drive the money in that direction. And a lot of the services, you know, the the digital MVPDs, right? They're new services. A lot of them were introduced over the past year, and so they're just getting started. And I think uh, we're going to see a lot more consumer traction over the. Well, what about the global year. trends? I mean, obviously that's U.S. trends. What about European and APAC? I mean, obviously you're active in both those in the, both those regions. Where do you see? What kind of interesting trend? Because obviously Europe is much much more fragmented, sure. and it's not it's not as cut and dry as the U.S. market. Right. So, what do you see as the trends there? Is connected TV a big a big trend in in, in Europe potentially, or is there something happens? Yeah, I think it's the the markets are, are different. The U.S. television market is definitely uh, definitely unique. Uh, as we move to Europe, the the economics of the whole situation are different. For example, free to air is quite common in a lot of the European markets. In the U.S. market, it, it exists, but predominantly for commercial use. Yeah. So, so you don't really see, like personally in my network, I don't know anybody. I have one buddy who does who, who who gets the the signal via free to air, really technically <laughs> advanced guy, right? But I don't know anybody else it's who does. Big that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, pretty much everyone ha has had it historically a pay TV subscription, and now obviously you're seeing folks move to more of the connected TV and. OTT model, but uh, if you move to Europe, it's a very different dynamic and, and really rest of world. Uh, and so the traction that connected TV has had in various markets, I think it, it varies dramatically based on which region, which, which region you're talking about. But I think there's no doubt it's a very powerful global trend that most folks are paying attention to at this stage. And do you have to nuance your strategy towards different, different parts of the world? I mean, like, when you come to Europe, do you have to, like, as a CRO, you're always thinking, how do I, I can't just take one model here that walks here. Do you have to think about those markets in a different different context? Yeah, we de definitely have to have a, a different approach by market. Uh, so personally, not living and breathing it day in and day out, I have to do a lot of re research before <laughs> we, we enter a market and spend a lot of time there. But uh, yeah, we definitely have to address each market independently with a different strategy.
And which one do you see as, as sort of like uh, setting the pace? Is the, f- the French market's always been quite interesting, but is UK pretty interesting as well? Or which of the which of the big European markets is really kind of sort of you know pushing, yeah, pushing the envelope? We, we see we, we see some interesting dynamics. So I think in the U.S. market, um, it, it, there's a, a big big pervasiveness of some of this new hardware like Apple TV and uh, Roku, right? And uh, these experiences are, are totally changing the way things. Uh, that consumers are, are engaging with television. If you look at other markets, perhaps like France, I, I think perhaps the, the pay TV providers have done a good job allowing consumers to manage the way yeah. that they want to access television and, and video content. Yeah. And so you, it's created a little bit of a different dynamic in terms of who consumers are dealing with. And so. is, is, is there a fear factor for those people though? I mean, I, I, the sense I get is those big broadcasters, particularly Europe, are fearful of the, dip, the big two, Facebook, Google, sure. eating their lunch. I mean, is that is that pushing them to kind of make the big steps into programmatic, or are they, or is it just natural innovation? I think the numbers are pretty much scary for everyone globally at this point. Um, you know, definitely the the duopoly is absorbing huge chunks of the ad-supported budgets. I think TV has historically been one of those mediums where Kept those them out. yeah those two aren't aren't really major players. But I think everyone has their eye on as, as the future of television evolves, are they going to be, become major players? Yeah. Um, or are the uh, sort of the current incumbents gonna retain sort of a lot of the uh, a lot of the business there? And that's to be determined for sure. And I also, it's, it's interesting as well, I mean, that you're, the, the independence thing, right? Um, Google and Facebook aren't trusted in TV. When on display, they've just basically ripped and pillaged their way through the, the industry. <laughs> and now in TV, the TV guys don't we want to work with them. It's interesting to see the ecosystem in TV doesn't seem to have those two kind of propping up in terms of the ad serving or, or sort of like the, the ecosystem itself. Yeah, I think uh, and if we look at our business specifically in that, in that context, first of all, we need to win on product and service, right? Hands down. But it's certainly been helpful. I think a lot of folks are looking for an alternative. While they know they need to work with uh, a lot of those major players you've, you've referenced, I'm not sure folks are completely comfortable building their entire business on their infrastructure. Yeah. Um, and so it's been it's certainly been a tailwind for for SpotX in the market. We have a customer first, first approach. Media owners are our core customer. There's no question about that. And so that sort of unwavering focus has been helpful for us. And is that one one of the big themes here in Cannes? So how do we? How do we contain these two? <laughs> How do we keep put them in the box? We have more of a customer-centric approach. Approach. We're, we're really focused on helping our customers bring sort of best-of-breed solutions to the market. But of course, I think that's on everyone's mind. Right. Well, Sean, thanks for your time. And thanks interesting for overview me. of uh, Sparks and, and what's going on this year. So thank you. Absolutely, thank you. And we'll see you next time on Trader Talk TV.